when he was granted, when he was given the Nobel Peace Prize, when he ultimately became Archbishop, uh, but also for the, the years and decade before that, um, the Arch was always one of many um, anti-apartheid figures that spoke out. Uh, he was not the singular one, or even in the 70s, the, the major one. Uh, there were a number of them, and he was one of that number. Uh, he actually grew out of uh, the Black consciousness circles that Stephen Biko uh, was central to. That was more the center of his politics. And he, uh, he became you know, a part of the South African Council of Churches and one of the leading clerics and voices because he had a particular uh, charismatic ability to, to speak well. And he had that, uh, that laughter and that, that spiritual side that meshed so well in connecting with uh, people of all different ideologies and faiths and races and ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds. So he obviously was, you know, was one of the key leaders but the thing that really distinguished him in the early 80s and ultimately I think led uh, for the winning of the Nobel Peace Prize, which was, uh, as I've also written, pushed by uh, some Quaker activists, uh, American Friends Service Committee in particular, and their representative, uh, my, my dear mentor and the person who ultimately became my stepfather, Bill Sutherland, uh, was one of those who pushed, pushed, pushed for the archbishop to to get the prize uh, as a representative of uh, the AFSC, which was the 1947 Nobel Peace Prize winning organization. Uh, and I think the Nobel Committee uh, accepted it and recognized it. Obviously we know the Nobel Committee sometimes does things with absolute brilliance and sometimes does things that are unthinkable. Some of us are still spinning with the fact that Henry Kissinger won the Nobel Peace Prize. But in the case of Tutu and, and the 1984 prize, it was, uh, it was quite an extraordinary understanding that Tutu was doing something and saying something a little bit different. And the difference was this. It was the ability to say clearly and prophetically and profoundly that the divestment campaigns that were beginning to heat up internationally and that were beginning to get some success, that were beginning to actually isolate the apartheid regime politically and also hurt them even just a little bit economically were okay as far as blacks fighting for freedom in South Africa. See the neoliberal and the liberal myth and what both major political parties in the US were trying to say is we can't do divestment because you know what? It'll hurt those poor blacks in South Africa. The money you know, that we take away will, 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 will hurt them too. And Archbishop Tutu made it his business to put the lie to that as publicly as possible. Uh, he said over and over again, we're hurt by apartheid. That's the hurt. If you divest from the South African apartheid regime, yeah, there may be some economic hardships in, in the country, but we're already at the bottom of the barrel and we've already figured out ways to survive without the help of the apartheid state because they don't really help us that much at all. They hurt us way, way more than they help us. So all of this you know, liberal, neoliberal rhetoric that suggests that divesting from apartheid will hurt blacks in South Africa is ridiculous. And that became Archbishop Tutu's uh, carrying ball through the early eighties. And eventually when he won the Nobel prize, he was able to use that position to push that further and further, making it so that even President Ronald Reagan was forced by the international movements and by the movements here in the US uh, to do some and sign some divestment acts, which ultimately were uh, for many of us, the key, not the only, but the key uh, piece uh, that ended apartheid. Certainly it was the key international nonviolent piece uh, that sought to the end of apartheid and Archbishop Tutu's peace in that was important, not just because he was a, a campaigner, but because he really spoke truth to the realities of what divestment would and wouldn't be. And, you know, parenthetically, he continued to do that uh, after apartheid in terms of what he and others have called Israeli apartheid, 
and the uh, the persecution of Palestinians and the BDS campaign uh, for Palestinian freedom, which of course Archbishop Tutu was a major, major supporter of. Okay, the second uh, South African anti-apartheid uh, or, or apartheid related part of his history that I think gets mythologized, obviously, um, no future without forgiveness uh, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Those parts of his, uh, of his history and his legacy uh, shine large and shine clear. Um, but especially as also a one-time representative of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, I want us to be very, very careful about the way reconciliation looms large over uh, Tutu's legacy. Uh, because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had, in fact, as much to do about the truth, that word, than reconciliation, that other word. And we often focus on the reconciliation part because it's uh, maybe unusual, because in, uh, in movements for liberation and struggle, we often don't have that reconciliation part. So for peacemakers, seeing those peace and justice components come together nicely is, uh, is beautiful and loving. Uh, but I want us to be a little bit cautious about that because uh, for, for the archbishop and I think for many uh, around him, again, I, I've said this before and I'm hoping to, to add this with a more nuanced example. Um, the strategic component of the creation of the TRC was to get out the truth. That was the first and second and, and, and third. That was the foremost object of the TRC. Why? Because just when the TRC was being uh, conceptualized and birthed, there was beginning to be a echo, a stream, especially within white South Africa, after 1994, leading up to uh, just at the 94 elections, the first elections, uh, uh, and you know, officially ending apartheid and, and uh, voting Nelson Mandela into the presidency, this echo that maybe it didn't really happen. Maybe it really wasn't so bad. And what we know of as denialism, Holocaust denialism, I hear this now COVID-19 denialism, this idea that apartheid was a legal policy that was a bit racist, we're so sorry that we had those bad laws, but that it wasn't in fact a long-term, well-conceived historic policy of genocide, that it wasn't what it was, was beginning to echo through the corridors of power, even in post-apartheid South Africa. Uh, so I, I, I'll tell a little uh, joke, uh, reflection. Uh, another close South African friend of mine, Dennis Brutus, uh, the poet. Um, you know, Dennis lived in exile uh, for most of the apartheid years after being in prison uh, in Robben Island uh, when he was a young man. But uh, Dennis was a great poet, South African liberator, who's one of the people who was mostly involved in a leader of the sports divestment campaign, getting South African uh, apartheid uh, sports teams to be essentially uh, not allowed into the Olympics and, and to be boycotted internationally. Well, after apartheid was over, after 94, uh, Dennis uh, went back. Uh, he first went back for some visits and then went back to live the last years of his life. And when Dennis came back to the States uh, after visiting South Africa, uh, 80, you know, 95, 96 post apartheid, he said, you know, Matt, it's the most extraordinary thing I talked to many, many people uh, about, you know, on the street friends, but, but just, you know, many people just, you know, in, in the colleges on the streets. And uh, it turns out no one was ever in favor of apartheid. I didn't meet one person. <laughs> they were all against it, always. How did this happen? Because the, the apartheid denialism, especially amongst whites, was beginning to get thick in society. And so Tutu and others were clear that they needed to use their position to create a space where the truth of apartheid would be incontrovertible. 
where there would be a record of testimony where people would talk about the horrors that would be clear, documented, publicized to all of South African society in the world and undeniable. And so the truth part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission always came first and continues to be prominent. That is not to take away from any of the reconciliation pieces of it. It's just to say, when the headlines today talk about, oh, he was a great reconciler, he loved his enemy, and he got black and whites to come together and sing and, you know, sing Kumbaya and Hut. Yes, yes, that was a piece of it. But it was based on the struggle against apartheid and the coming out of truthful pieces of what it was so it could not be denied by future generations. If those two prerequisites were fully met, a successful one struggle, even if only partially won, political apartheid ended, economic apartheid still exists in South Africa. But even if just partially won, a struggle and a public acknowledgement of the heinous truths of what it was, if those prerequisites are met, possibly we could begin talking about reconciliation. Possibly we could think about living together in a new society, in a new South Africa. And there is a fourth element, which isn't in the title of TRC, but is in the principles of TRC as outlined by the TRC and by Archbishop Tutu, and that is reparations. Reparations is a part and parcel of the TRC process. And this is beyond the scope of, of what we, I think, have time for today, although we can talk about it in the Q&A and the dialogue later. But a lot of the TRC policies that Archbishop Tutu and the commissioners set forward were never actualized. The South African government took some of their advice and accepted some of their, their critiques, but not all. So the reparations piece, which was always intended to be a major part of the TRC, um, was only partially uh, fully acknowledged and fully uh, acted upon. So really from Tutu's point of view, struggle, truth, reparations, and then reconciliation. And uh, it's not about just showcasing or singularizing reconciliation uh, as the, uh, the only or the major goal. You don't jumpstart to reconciliation unless you have those other pieces. And I think that's... All right, um, I'll say a few more jump quickly into the dialogue as much as possible, but I want to say a, a couple of more things. So, um, yeah, there are ways in which people are mythologized and iconized that, that make them so oversimplified that I think uh, our ability to learn the lessons of movement building become more difficult and lost. So, uh, you know, Archbishop Tutu, like Nelson Mandela before him, uh, will, you know, become giants of nonviolence and pacifism, um, but they were not. And I, I say that again, as a member of War Resistance League and Fellowship of Reconciliation and two nonviolence groups, and it's not that they were anti-nonviolence at all, uh, but Nelson Mandela could have uh, been freed from prison any number of the 27 years uh, before he was, if he had just said to the apartheid regime, uh, I will publicly denounce the armed struggle. He served those 27 years because he refused to do that. And, you know, um, Archbishop, though, may be closer to a nonviolence position because of uh, his, his deep, deep, uh, you know, spiritual Christian, uh, you know, foundation, uh, was nonetheless someone who was never, ever willing um, to use either a nonviolence politics or his Christianity uh, to, to suggest to other people how to wage struggle. 
So he was definitely uh, a revolutionary. And if one wants to talk about nonviolence, one has to, at very least, uh, talk about what more of us are calling revolutionary nonviolence. And Michael mentioned Jim Lawson. I believe Jim has a, a book coming out uh, in a few months uh, titled Revolutionary Nonviolence. So it's that type of uh, engaged, uh, radical, uh, unarmed protest that was at the heart of, of Tutu's politics, not a simplistic pacifism. Um, so similarly, uh, the majority of the work I ended up doing with the Arch over the decades uh, was to work around US political prisoners. Uh, you know, the Arch was always concerned about injustice and human rights everywhere. Uh, an anti-colonial position was uh, a major part of that. So he supported uh, deeply the struggles of Palestinian people, the struggles of Puerto Rican people, uh, the struggles of West Saharan and Kashmiri and West Papuan, Tibetan people all around the world for, for sovereignty, for independence and anti-colonial, anti-neo-colonial perspective was, was a deeply part of his internationalism and his ethic. And he understood that in the US context, that meant that the Black Panthers and the Puerto Rican independentistas and others uh, who were imprisoned and, and many of whom still are imprisoned for decades uh, because of their political beliefs, even if they also, some of them committed acts that were part of what landed them in prison, uh, the political beliefs is what got them the ridiculous draconian sentences the torturous treatment, uh, really the inhumane uh, political situation that the US political prisoners found and find themselves in. Uh, and he was always willing, uh, always willing uh, to lend his voice uh, and his, his prestige uh, and his words to, uh, to the work to free all political prisoners. And I became his main US conduit to those movements. So be it Mumia Abu-Jamal or Lenin Peltier, uh, be it some of the successful campaigns like Oscar Lopez Rivera and the other Puerto Rican prisoners like David Gilbert and Jaleel Muntaquim who have gotten out in the last some years. Uh, for those of you in California, you know, Tutu had his name attached to the, the San Francisco 7, wait, San Francisco 8. Oh, geez, now I'm, now I'm mixing up my numbers because I have too many gray hairs. But you know, he was always willing to and 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 uh, excited about uh, and and really concerned about uh, making an impact strategically. And, and I say strategically because he did understand the power of his words and his presence. It's no joke, and we understood this. I'm going to talk about this as an organizer now. We understood on the other side of the the waters that, um, for example, Bill Clinton was not going to all of a sudden uh, become um, moved by the plight of Puerto Rico. We understood it was gonna be a real politique, political consideration. Is his wife gonna run for office? Is she gonna need the Latino vote? Is he gonna do this, that, and the other thing? And so on the one hand, movements of protest grassroots building of popular mobilizations. On the other hand, legal windows and doors to open to walk through. And on the third hand, what could we quietly as a movement give the president of the United States, one of the most powerful men in the world, what could we give him as backup to do the right thing? And one of the things that we gave him and we knew we were giving him was a note that said, in, in the case of the, the, the 14 uh, Puerto Rican prisoners that were released at the end of Clinton's administration, we gave him documents that said that Archbishop Desmond Tutu, 1984 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and Mrs. Coretta Scott King, widow of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., supported the release of these prisoners. And lo and behold, after Clinton released them, granted them clemency after massive popular campaigns and after the right wing started attacking him, what was the first words out of Clinton's mouth? I, 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 I was told by Archbishop Tutu and Coretta Scott King to free them. They, they, they told me it was good, it was okay. So we knew that. 
we knew that, uh, and we predicted that, and we predicted that if Barack Obama was going to grant clemency to Oscar Lopez Rivera, which he did, I believe, three or four days before leaving office at the ultimate last possible moment, um, we expected that Barack Obama would say, well, Archbishop Tutu and these other Nobel laureates uh, you know, suggested this is an important thing. It's, it's a humanitarian thing uh, for a variety of reasons because there was so much going on with the inauguration of uh, the president that followed Barack Obama. Um, he did not get as much direct uh, attack for freeing Oscar, uh, but we knew, uh, and the Archbishop and I talked about at length, uh, what it would mean for Barack to make that decision. Again, none of us, neither of us expected that he was going to come to a prophetic, pro-justice, Puerto Rican, sovereignty and independence mindset. His politics were not going to fundamentally change. But what would affect him uh, in addition to the mass movements that could enable this shift and this change? Uh, because we have to look at things from multi-strategic and multi-tactical points of view. And so, yes, when you have someone like Archbishop Tutu, and yes, it's very sad that he's gone in a way, uh, you know, he and I knew three years ago uh, that the kind of positions we did were not going to take place anymore because he was not in a position in the last few years to, to, to do those kinds of things, to make those kinds of videos that we produce to, to be at conferences or those kinds of written statements. Uh, but, you know, He's not the only one. Uh, we have other Nobel laureates. We have other figures. We have to figure out how to use our, our own icons more strategically. We have to figure out how to use our own voices and our own connections with people more strategically and more, more tactfully uh, and more tactically uh, in, in ways that can bring about the kind of liberation and change uh, we need. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll end just by saying a brief word about the tribunal and then uh, a closing joke to the formal part of this and the rest of the time we can have in, uh, in, uh, in dialogue and conversation. So it was a great honor uh, for me to take all of the uh, things I've learned over the decades in my international work, but also my work here in the US uh, to be a part of the coordinating committee of this thing called the International Tribunal on U.S. human rights abuses against Black, Brown, and Indigenous peoples. Uh, the International Tribunal, which took place virtually and in New York uh, it, at the end of October, just uh, last year, 2021, was organized by a coalition called the Spirit of Mandela Coalition. Uh, Michael, uh, you know, your own Michael Novick has been uh, a part of that and, uh, and, and many, many others. And amongst the many things that this tribunal tried to do, and it, it was coordinated by uh, a coalition, and there are seven of us on the coordinating committee, uh, myself, including several prominent former political prisoners, uh, including Julio Montequim and Jihad Abdul Mumida, of the National Jericho Movement, and, uh, and Seiko Odinga. It's also a very heavy Muslim presence. So there's a deeply spiritual interfaith part of that work as well. Uh, but the International Tribunal harkened back to uh, the December 1951 calls by Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois and William Patterson uh, to the early, what was then the very young uh, United Nations, saying, we charge genocide. We charge the U.S. with genocide. And so uh, a few months ago, those charges were brought up again. Uh, and those charges, of course, have had different tribunals and different calls and different reverberations in these last seven decades, in these last 70 years. But a, a, an international panel of jurists, uh, human rights activists, lawyers, and legal scholars, and others uh, presided over these days of hearings, not exactly a truth and reconciliation commission, but it was modeled on that idea of having uh, both experts, but also people on the front line of, of experiencing the different struggles. Uh, and there were five specific counts under the general call of, of genocide. And at the end of that time, at a press conference in front of the United Nations, the U.S. was found guilty of genocide. So using that verdict 
using the international connections because the jurists have, in, in some cases, high up positions within UNESCO or within the UN Committee on uh, the People of African Descent or the UN Decolonization Committee, using those, uh, those verdicts and, and that testimony, uh, which is gonna be made more and more available in the weeks to come, uh, is part of the legacy of Archbishop Tutu. There's no question that, uh, you know, had the tribunal happened three or more years ago, uh, Tutu would have been one of the uh, people introducing it and, and sending videos to it. Uh, as it is, her, his family and his daughters, you know, have been in touch and involved. Uh, we did actually get the daughter of Nelson and Winnie Mandela uh, to send uh, uh, an introductory uh, greeting and letter of support. So the idea of the spirit of Mandela is not just about Nelson. It's not just about any one person. We actually included in explicitly Winnie Mandela and Grasse Michelle and Rosa Parks and Fannie Lou Hamer. If you look at the little... Uh, photos uh, at the end of the, the Spirit of Mandela logo. It's not just Nelson, we included those others, including women, including US women who are our Mandelas. But the Spirit of Mandela really was about, um, in many ways, some of the Mandela rules that have been accepted by the United Nations and other bodies about the minimum treatment of prisoners and about basic human rights uh, uh, as they should be practiced every part of the world. And we know that our own country here, the US, has a long way to go uh, in terms of living up to any kinds of basic human rights principles and practices. And so we fight. We fight for, for greater human rights. We fight for the liberation of people. We fight for the independence of Puerto Rico. We fight for the freedom of all peoples and all political prisoners. And maybe today or tomorrow we do so uh, with a keen reflection on the legacy of Archbishop Tutu and all of his strategic and tactically profound uh, interventions and ideas. So, a priest, a rabbi, and Archbishop Tutu are in a boat on a lake. And at some point, the boat begins to get a hole in it, sink, catch fire, I don't know, some catastrophic everything. And so how are we going to get, how are we going to survive? How are we going to get to, to, to land? I, I don't know why they couldn't just swim, but that's not part of the joke. So Archbishop Tutu says, I'll, I'll work to get help. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll walk to the shore. And lo and behold, the Archbishop gets out of the boat and begins to walk mm -hmm. on the surface of the water to shore. The priest is pretty amazed, but following carefully in the archbishop's footsteps, walks on the water to shore. The rabbi is looking at the two of them and <clears throat> beginning to put his foot out of this now stinking boat and, and, and looking kind of nervous. And the priest says to the archbishop, should we tell him about the rocks? And the archbishop says to the priest, what rocks? Okay. Um, that's my second bad joke. <laughs> Groaning is now uh, or clapping or uh, mainly uh, providing your own comments and questions and thoughts. Uh, the floor is open and it's great to be talking to you all. Okay. Thank you so much. I learned a lot and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, what we normally do when we have questions, because otherwise it can get a little crazy sometimes, uh, people put their hand up kind of on the chat and, oh my gosh, there's already three hands up ahead of us. And I will just call on the people, otherwise it gets kind of out of control. So just in order of the hands, I'm going to start with uh, Mike Novick. He's the first top hand here. Mike? Okay, yeah, sorry, I, I put my hand up last, but- uh, oh, I, you're the I, I, Sorry, it's because you're host, that's why. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just say I really appreciated all these remarks and, and uh, uh, I was wondering if you want to say a little bit more about Bill Sutherland, and uh, uh, Matt. Well, that's that's very sweet. Um, yeah, I'll say a little bit more. I can't, I can't help but, but stay. Bill, 
who was a remarkable figure um, in in the world, I think, and in in my life, most certainly. He went from being my mentor uh, through the 1980s when I was in my my 20s and early 30s. Uh, to becoming my my collaborator, we we became uh, true partners because he insisted to not have me uh, as a, a a scribe or a ghostwriter or a, a, an assistant. He he wanted me, despite our our age difference and our our difference in you know racial compositions. He wanted me to be a full partner. So we became co-authors of what was my first significant book. I mean, this is this is my first, but the real published book that was my first was in 2000, uh, called Guns and Gandhi in Africa, published by Africa World Press, Guns and Gandhi in Africa. Archbishop Tutu wrote the, uh, the forward to that book as well, the introduction to that book as well. Um, and... Uh, and then he, uh, much to my surprise, years later, uh, hooked up with my mom and became my stepdad. So that's who Bill was to me. Now I'll say something about how, how, who Bill was uh, in, in, in life. Bill was uh, an African-American uh, Quaker background uh, who ended up uh, becoming one of those World War II conscientious objectors who just said because of their own conscience, so they were, you know, strict anti-fascist. They they couldn't fight in the U.S. Imperial War. That was just not what they felt comfortable with. And so, along with Bayard Rustin, David Dellinger, Ralph DeGia, a host of others, uh, he did time in Lewisburg as a conscience objector. And after getting out in '45, uh, he and Dellinger and some others uh, did a bicycle ride uh, for uh, basically an end to atomic weapons. It was one of the very first, uh, one of the earliest uh, anti-Cold War actions and disarmament actions. And it was to be truly international. They were going to bicycle from New York to Moscow. Huh? They didn't bicycle the whole way and there was some water involved. But in Europe, uh, he met uh, a bunch of African students and particularly struck uh, with one another as a, an African-American peace leader and these African students, they said, man, you've got to, you've got to come. You've got to come to the continent. There's stuff bursting and, 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 and happening that you have to see and be part of. And, and as he always said, not, uh, not expecting the burst of movement that was going to come in the U.S. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, he uh, essentially um, took up his whole life uh, got support from A.J. Musty and, and other elders of the movement at that time and, uh, and, and moved uh, essentially for the rest of his life in, in 1953 to what was then Gold Coast and uh, was going to become Ghana, the first independent country uh, with Kwame Nkrumah at, at, the, at the helm. Um, Phil also uh, after or a little bit before Nkrumah uh, was deposed in a, in a coup d'etat, uh, then moved to Tanzania uh, in uh, East Africa, Southern uh, East Africa. Uh, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania became the center of the frontline states. So all of those freedom fighters struggling for an end to apartheid, for freedom of Namibia, uh, for freedom of what was to become Zimbabwe and Zambia, Rhodesia, uh, freedom of Mozambique and Angola, all of those freedom fighters most of which, by the way, were not pacifists. <laughs> in fact, many of them were the leaders uh, of and the commanders of the armed struggles that in some of the cases were gonna become successful in the ensuing years. They all had uh, their uh, main offices and homes in Dar es Salaam. And as the story goes, the place that they hung out to hear great new US jazz, and to talk strategy and tactics and politics was uh, Bill's, uh, you know, Bill's backyard uh, on the shores of, uh, of uh, the Bahari Beach in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So he became this figure, this uh, what we, you know, what we call this uh, unofficial ambassador uh, between African American U.S. peace movements and uh, and the continent and a place to talk about strategies and tactics. Now, he didn't really convince anyone that they should you know, lay down their arms and become nonviolent activists. They didn't 
convince him that he should take up arms and join them and, and, and join them in the bush. But there was a clear understanding that revolutionary nonviolence meant working together in unity for the liberation of people. It meant self-determination for all people. So that one group doesn't get to tell another how to wage their struggle. It meant that the main role of US activists and Bill never, uh, never pretended that he wasn't from the US. That was his base. We lived from 1953 till basically until 2003, the last few years he lived with my mom in Brooklyn. Uh, but you know, for all of those years, he was a Pan-Africanist based on the continent, but he understood that his role was as a US activist. So you know, the other principle was the job of the US activist is to get the US boot off the back of the people of Africa, be it through support of the colonial regimes or the apartheid regime back in the day, or through AFRICOM and other military uh, means today, AFRICOM, which grew with more US boots on the ground in Africa under Barack Obama's administration than in any other administration since the development of AFRICOM several uh, years ago. So that was Bill, and, uh, and Bill was a rather uh, striking figure who amongst other things for some years in the 70s and 80s worked for the American Friends Service Committee. And as they say, uh, 1947, AFSC won the Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Peace laureates always get to have a special spot in recommending future laureates. And so for several years, Bill as AFSC's representative pushed, 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 pushed that this guy Bishop and then Archbishop Tutu would win the Nobel Prize because they had to spotlight the work against apartheid in South Africa. And in 1984, they took AFSCs and Bill Sutherland's advice. Bill, uh, Archbishop always, uh, you know, credited Bill in part for his winning of the Nobel Prize. So even though I, I actually got to, to meet the Arch and, and have his work uh, with me on this calendar through Ivan Toms uh, in, the, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, my, many of my other meetings uh, till the time of, of, uh, of Bill's passing 12 years ago uh, were with Bill Sutherland. So um, no doubt the Arch and I became closer and more like family because of the extraordinary life and work of Bill Sutherland. Thank you for asking that, Michael. Thank you. Um, Rick. Um, thank you very much. I, um, uh, Mr. Mai, I thought that was a, a, a very amazing talk and amazing experience, you know, your being able to relay your experiences. Um, it's, uh, frankly, it's also really good to hear that Bill Sutherland was a jazz fan and spreading that, uh, you know, spreading the gospel of swing to a certain extent. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about when we're, when you're talking about the concept of reconciliation, um, I, I finding that I, I think progressives and, and people that um, are of this side of reality and this side of, of truth don't have a hard time framing in, in today's world of three second sound bites, if we're lucky and, and um, social media that doesn't, you know, handle depth that well. Uh, as an example, a really good idea got distilled into defund the police. And that's what media ran with. And, um, you know, uh, was a way for, for someone to discount everything that was included in the idea that you, you know, uh, maybe things that don't have to do with actual policing can be handled by better groups. And I, when I think about reconciliation as, as opposed to reparations, I think people think that reparations will come out of their own pocket while reconciliation is something that's a, a deeper um, process that actually takes a couple more beats before someone can dismiss it totally. And um, I wanted to see if you felt that that has any value or any um, you know, any resonance for what the ultimate goal is? Wow, great question. Um, 
I think I'm going to try to answer that a little more briefly because I don't want to dominate and I do want more dialogue. But I think if I'm understanding the question cor correctly, Rick, I think the, the, the key thing is both. Uh, yes, there's resonance there because the personal is political. Uh, because we have to find personal and individual hooks into larger political schemes. Now, the personal is political doesn't mean that the personal trumps political or vice versa. So the campaigning for institutional reparations, both governmental and non-governmental institutional reparations is key, which doesn't mean that individual acts of reparation and reconciliation aren't also important. And, and so if we try to substitute one for the other or forget that those concepts aren't deeply interconnected, then we get very lost. We get, we get in the muddle of, you know, a sort of chicken and egg. I don't even want to say which is more important, which comes first. I wouldn't do that. Again, there's a chicken and egg thing to that. And in fact, you know, part of understanding of truly revolutionary politics is to understand that no revolution on earth in the history of the planet, and I am you know, when I'm not giving talks like this, uh, apparently a, a historian, that's my craft and my work and what I used to get paid for when I was a teacher. But the fact is, um, we know that no revolution in history ever succeeded without a multiplicity of tactics and strategies. There's not one winning strategy. Oh, if we only get that line correctly, there are better strategies than others. There are more effective campaigns than others but it's never singular. There's always a multiplicity of strategies and tactics. There's always a human interpersonal element and a political element. If we had figured out ways in which Barack Obama would feel moved by or have a cover to say, oh, Archbishop Tutu said I should release Oscar Lopez Rivera, that would not have been enough without the mass movement. Not nearly, not nearly enough. On the other hand, we all believe that the mass movement needed to be supplemented by some whispers inside. Hey, do this. It's the right thing to do, and it'll actually help your legacy. If you want to write your books about your legacy, the Puerto Rican movement is going to trash you entirely and do everything they can to make sure that the entire Latino you know, population trashes you if you don't do this. So, you know, it's both. It's always both. It's often both. And so we understand strategy in that complex, multifaceted way. And to be better organizers, we had best do that quickly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Stephen Fisk. You're muted, dear brother. Stephen, you're uh, muted. Stephen, yeah. please. I'm, I'm thank you very much for this, this uh, wonderful talk and and your jokes as well. It's all it's very much appreciated. Um, I think as the, the question comes out of the history of colonialism in the United States, plantation capitalism, the ethnic cleansing of Native Americans, and the normalization of white supremacy and systemic racism. The question is about the psychological phenomenon of denialism and revisionism and the absolute manic motivation to maintain that absolute fixation, which seems to me uh, is a major component of the dysfunction of our democracy. And now we see the Republican party becoming absolutely addicted to cult to the cult of denialism, revisionism, and authoritarian Trumpism. So I'm asking, can you speak to the psychology of this phenomenon of de denialism and revisionism that is absolutely tearing our country apart? Uh, yes, dear Stephen, that might be another entire topic. <laughs> I, 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 that, is a, that is a profound and complicated question. I'm not sure I have even channeling my, my dear uh, departed friend and mentor, Archbishop Tutu, I'm not sure if I have uh, the profundities to answer that one. Um, how does one, look, 
it's been a long time since I believe that education alone would would solve our issues. And I'm a, I'm an educator, right? You know, I was a teacher, a high school teacher first, a college professor. Uh, I, I put in the chat uh, the organization I'm currently the secretary, you know, global secretary general of is called the International Peace Research Association. So I I just put that uh, website in the chat. I think I I think I typed the websites correctly, but. Um, Nonetheless, despite understanding the power of education, uh, it's been a long time since I felt that education alone uh, could can do it. Uh, what does one do to raise consciousness such that denialism becomes more difficult, more complicated? Thank you, Michael. I knew you'd fix it. Um, and the fact is, uh, yes, I think, Stephen, you asked that question in part because Truth and Reconciliation Commission, because in some ways the tribunal, you know, for, for many people, especially people, you know, in the leadership of the Black Liberation Movement, former Panthers or, or Panthers who are former political prisoners, because they often remind me that once a Panther, always a Panther. So former political prisoners who spent, you know, decades in the dungeons, people, you know, Seiko Odinga, you know, and Jaleel Muntaquim, you know, they, they make Mandela's 20, 20 some odd years look like nothing. Jaleel spent almost 50 years, 50 years in prison. And there are people like uh, Sundiat Akoli, who is, you know, in his 80s, who spent similar decades and decades. And so even though those folks can say genocide, human rights abuses, unlike anything on earth, a denialism, on the part of the US government that these things exist. The US continues to say, we have no political prisons in the US, which is even more of a joke when you have some people uh, like the Puerto Ricans whose main charge against them was seditious conspiracy, which is nothing but a thought crime. It's nothing but an understanding of the political nature of the imprisonment. So how to break through. And in some ways the tribunal that we did in October was a means of saying that we had to present to an international audience that was not already with us, the idea of an independent panel of jurists. And we didn't choose people. I mean, the jurists came together not because there were some right-wing pundits, but they also weren't all just us. They weren't, you know, like we were very careful that if you had a long history of supporting Mumia Abu-Jamal, you couldn't really be a jurist. There had to be some independence in this panel of jurists from their work with the US. They, they had to have some ability in their own uh, human rights uh, credentials to have an ability to, to judge the US, not just from the inside. We did have one or two people from the US itself serve on the panel. But for example, uh, the, the, one of the main ones uh, US uh, is the UNESCO chair on genocide prevention. Okay, we thought he was an important voice even though he's from the US. And, and so to say to this international panel that in our minds represent the international agencies we now have to go out to and work for this year and next year, to say, look, genocide in the US, human rights abuse in the US based on political imprisonment, police killings, hyper mass incarceration, environmental racism, and uh, health inequities. Those were the five basic charges that made up the, uh, the counts of, of, of genocide. That these things are not rhetoric, that they're not just something that's happened to a, a select few here and there last year, that they're his systemic and that they're historic. And so putting out these materials in a way that hopefully will become more and more accessible hopefully will make the denialism that you're talking about, Stephen, more difficult. Now, I'm giving a very, very close to the heart, uh, tactical way in which we've tried to answer that question. But let's be clear, Stephen's question is much deeper and more profound and definitely deserves more conversation than we have time for today. I will say this about the tribunal, uh, that website uh, and the, the YouTube page of uh, Spirit of Mandela, and Michael, you may want to fetch that, but the YouTube page of Spirit of Mandela has the unedited 20 plus hours of testimony 
uh, including the verdict and including you know the the all the witnesses and the 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 prosecutors uh, opening and closing statements however uh, that work is being professionally packaged now and uh, an independent black owned TV network and, and station exposure TV uh, is going to be doing a five part mini series on this uh, that's going to be available for Black History Month in February. So yeah, the hope is to make this much more mass understood to chip away at that denialism that Stephen's asking about. And obviously we'll let you know when that stuff is going to air and, and how to, 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 to watch it. But I think that's part of the work is it's educational, it's organizing, it's consciousness raising, it's, it's person to person, but also mass level to figure out how to make denialism more complicated, how to make it more difficult. Because again, as Stephen said so poignantly, it's become pervasive and it's hard to, you know, like things have gotten to such a, an Orwellian level. War is not peace, no. War is not peace. They're different concepts and they can't be equated uh, unless one really wants to go into some kind of wacko Orwellian counter thing. So we have to continue talking about that question. Thank you. I mean, before I go on to the next person, what hits me so hard is the fact that all these people from the insurrection are now considered political prisoners by the other side. But that is just a side comment that I think could be an interesting discussion at some point. Uh, Carol Francis. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Matt. This is really amazing. Um, I want to know if a, a couple very brief questions. One is on Leonard's case. How do we use what you were talking about, um, what our leaders, Tutu and others have said, to help free him, um, along with a letter from one of his main prosecutors saying, we messed up, we shouldn't have convicted him, set him free. But my main question is on Palestine. Thank you for raising it. It's one of those parts of Tutu that don't get raised often. And I want to know, I'm fascinated by what you were saying about it's not enough to get together and sing Kumbaya. Uh, we need to actually have truth come out and we're not going to have the reconciliation just, well, we won't deal with truth. We'll just have jump right into reconciliation. How does that apply to Palestine? And if you could speak yeah, on I, I'm off screen for a second just to get some props because you know sometimes I'm inspired to, to have more things to bring to the screen. Um, I, I guess again, um, because both of those topics deserve, you know, uh, the freedom of Leonard Peltier and the liberation of, of Palestine, because both of them deserve um, their own two hours. Uh, I, I'm just going to touch on uh, some answers, but I think uh, there are there are a couple of things to, to look to. First of all, for Peltier work, I, I look most, uh, especially the international campaign uh, to free Leonard. And uh, I believe the, uh, the website, which Michael will, will quickly and soon send to us, um, has, uh, you know, has the most updated information on how to use that. And the tribunal has worked closely with those folks. Um, I, uh, you know, I actually just had the privilege of, of sending a personal note from Leonard uh, to uh, the Archbishop's family uh, mm -hmm. and, and a part of this little correspondence. So Leonard is very personally uh, aware of uh, what's happening in South Africa and, and his uh, Tutu's family is now uh, personally in touch with Leonard. So, you know, that, that those human connections continue and the tactical and strategic questions of what to do uh, really uh, need to be worked out in, in, I think, careful details. I think we have some new moments here. I don't really have a, a strong sense of what Biden might or might not do, but I think there's a window here, a little opportunity in the next couple of years, uh, given his elder status uh, and given some of the illness and given a number of different things in terms of 
U.S. Uh, government relations with the FBI. So I think there are some spaces to do work and to push and emphasize Leonard's case more in the next year. And I think those folks that Michael just put on the chat, uh, the international, uh, you know, campaign, which is uh, at the website, who is Leonard Peltier and the Jericho movement uh, are two of the places. And both of those are, are deeply, deeply involved. Uh, I, I was just turned on by them to this new book that I have not read, but just got in the mail, uh, which looks like uh, it's going to be an important contribution. It's a mainstream press. It's called I Will, How Four American Indians Put Their Lives on the Line and Change. I Will is the simple name of the book. Uh, and the uh, the author is uh, Sharon Wyatt Leonard, S-H-E-R-O-N. Um, I haven't read it yet, but it was recommended to me by Leonard's uh, people. And uh, Leonard is obviously one of the key featured people in, in the book. And it may be a new tool uh, for us to use in addition to the tribunal work. And yes, I grabbed uh, the book and also grabbed the kafia. This is uh, <laughs> close at hand because um, I, uh, you know, I have this kind of Santa look about me. So in, in December, especially <laughs> lots of people are asking for gifts. And so I, I, I wear a red along with this kafia. I, I did want to wear some purple for the archbishop, but I, I changed costumes because in a two hour show, you should have at least one costume change, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, the fact is, you know, the fact is there are, are many different ways of doing Palestine work. Uh, I couldn't help but note that in this particular circle, uh, we have a lot of Jewish, uh, uh, you know, representatives, you know, whether you're religious and active in a synagogue or whether you're uh, cultural or social or secular, uh, there is, I think, a special uh, responsibility and a special opportunity that, that, that we have. Uh, and I also think the younger generations of, of Jews in the U.S. Um, are making a mark. And, and, and we've just, hopefully we've just begun to see what that may be. Um, you know, from those big things uh, like U.S. policy in support of Palestine, in support of Palestine versus support of the Israeli military juggernaut, uh, there's also, I think, very specific things. So, for example, uh, and I, I don't have the call letters, but I imagine Michael can get them or find them. But uh, it was just just before the tribunal. So I guess it was just in, in middle October uh, that one of the more outrageous and I hope unsuccessful actions uh, of the Israeli government was to take, uh, I believe, six uh, Palestinian human rights organizations that were in fact uh, very, mm -hmm. uh, very much part of the Palestinian mainstream and essentially call them terrorists and, and begin attacking them and begin taking away their rights. One of them in particular is very close to me personally and politically, uh, the group Adamir. Uh, Adamir is the Palestinian group uh, that works on behalf of all Palestinian political prisoners. And their executive director, Sahar Francis, uh, a lawyer, uh, is not only a personal friend, but has been a friend to political prisoners in the US. She was one of those who, with me, uh, produced a video uh, for the release of Russell Maroon Schultz. Um, and in fact, the tribunal uh, and the Spirit of Mandela Coalition is now talking with Sahar and working on a webinar we'll do about international political prisoners and human rights issues combined. Uh, so, you know, supporting Adamir and supporting those groups that were recently criminalized by the uh, Israeli regime and, and breaking down that isolation that the Israeli government was trying to uh, enforce upon these mainstream Palestinian human rights groups uh, is something that I think can be done. Uh, and, uh, and anywhere from those kind of very specific, small kind of email and letter writing campaigns to the larger question of changing people's consciousness and, and ultimately changing U.S. policy in support of Israel are amongst the things we need to be thinking about. But uh, yeah, I mean, we have to remember that if uh, former President Jimmy Carter is calling, you know, Israel an apartheid regime, 
Mm -hmm. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu affirmed that, you know, we have to use, to me, we have to use those tools because those dudes are loved by many people. And so if you love Jimmy Carter and Archbishop Tutu work for the freedom of Palestinian people, it shouldn't be that big a disconnect, but it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, we could throw into those two Christian figures, some Jewish voices of note as well. I mean, we talk about Bill Sutherland, frankly, you know, in addition to, to, to putting his, his uh, to joining his family with mine in this interesting Quaker Jewish connection that we had, Christian mm -hmm. Jewish connection. Uh, you know, Bill also at a time, uh, actually in that time period between his time in Ghana and his time in Tanzania, uh, he spent some time in the Middle East and befriended and had a correspondence with Martin Buber. So, you know, we don't have to just talk about uh, Jimmy Carter or Archbishop Tutu. There are some Jewish voices we can put in the mix uh, that are suggesting that current U.S. policy towards Israel and Israeli policy towards Palestine is not at all acceptable and not at all what it should be. So another two hours on that, but that's the beginning answer. Um, Carol Francis, can you hold your second question? Because we're getting a little short on time. And I, I still have much. Anthony, Fernando, Fernando and Steve uh, kind of to ask questions. I did both of mine. Oh, you did both. Sorry, I thought you just did the one. Maybe they kind of they got confused. Ask, Rose, can I ask that we can I suggest that we ask those four to ask all four of the questions, and then I'll answer them in one. Yeah, that's exactly package. where my brain was going as well. So, oh, now Michael Novick, you've got your hand up again. I don't know whether that's intentional or not, um, but anyway, um, Anthony, can you ask your question and then? We'll move on to Fernando, Fernando, Steve, and then Michael, if you still got one. Well, first, I want to thank you so much for your presentation. It was extremely helpful to me, especially in having just come back from a rally about January 6th and the incredible denialism going on in our country about what happened a year ago and uh, what's happening with the uh, failed coup attempt and uh, all, all sorts of things. I think the most important lesson I got from your talk was the linking of truth, reparations, and reconciliation, that the three have to go together. And so I just wonder if you could say something more about that in the context of uh, what's happening in our country right now, especially uh, with respect to um, uh, teaching about our racist history in our schools. Thank you. Um, Fernando, Fernando? Yeah, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. It is uh, really uh, uh, educational for me, you know. And uh, on this uh, group, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, trying to contribute in terms of uh, ending the systemic racism, you know. Yeah, I guess my question is that, uh, is there anything that you can suggest, you know, in terms of uh, fighting the, or ending this uh, systemic racism here in the U.S. Uh, in in your experience to South Africa, you know, is there anything that uh, you can contribute or at least uh, give us an insight uh, in terms of maybe strategies and tactics and strategies how to battle this? Uh, ending systemic racism because uh, we have now uh, 2.3 million people uh, in jail. We know that this is, this is, a, this is a really a, a prison industrial complex, you know, and we're spending at least a trillion dollars, you know, a year on a, on a military industrial complex. Maybe can you try to, uh, you know, give us an insight or at least your experience in South Africa. Uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? Uh, Matt, thank you so much. I would take a longer amount of time as chair to thank you. Uh, I do want to tell you I have the authority to make you a card-carrying member of ICUJP. Uh, the time is a little later in your morning than our morning, and you are eagerly welcomed to join our meetings on these Friday mornings. 
Uh, I'll come right to my point. The motto of ICUJP is that religious communities must stop blessing war and violence. Uh, terms like armed revolution and political prisoners um, are labels used by people across the political spectrum. Uh, the people on January 6 uh, claim to be political prisoners and they claim to be engaged in revolution. You used a phrase that confused me, simplistic pacifism. I couldn't tell if that was your belief, you were attributing that to someone else, but um, uh, at least in the name of uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, is the kind of violence we saw on January 6 ever justified? Thank you. Uh, Michael, is your hand up intentionally again? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, I just want to add a couple of your comments. Uh, one was, uh, uh, maybe you could elaborate this in a little bit more. My understanding was that Tutu uh, began his uh, more open criticism of the ANC as a governing party uh, because they refused to follow up on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission with prosecutions of some of the people who are not uh, uh, forgiven or reconciled with. Uh, and uh, also, I think that uh, Tutu, uh, uh, in his Anglican faith, uh, actually believed in the just war doctrine. And I'm wondering, uh, I don't think he saw himself as a pacifist, actually. So uh, I know that you are an advocate of revolutionary nonviolence, uh, Matt, but I'm wondering if you could comment on that as well. Okay, I think that was the roundup questions. So um, good luck <laughs> answering them. Yeah. Nice gave such easy questions. You know, is answered by in a minutes. Anyway, um, that was also a joke, by the way. So uh, just to say, um, I will make some comments. Oops. Uh, all right, are you hearing me okay? Because it yes, sounded yeah. like I have. Okay, yeah. um, I'll make some comments uh, by way of, of, of closing words and, and accept the honor of being a member. And, and you know, I, I do love being with you and, uh, and we can have some more conversations, probably not today, uh, but in future, in future days to come, maybe even one day in person. Uh, let me, let me maybe, uh, deal with these in not exactly reverse order, but um, so I don't think that, that the Archbishop was either comfortable with uh, the label nonviolence or nonviolent activist or proponent of just war. I don't think he was particularly comfortable with either. And he shied away from talking about either of those uh, in, in self-description. So my best understanding, you know, when I talk about revolutionary nonviolence, even those words are, are, are complicated, I think. Uh, but complications are, are, are a good thing. Nuances, embracing, you know, apparent contradictions, uh, exploding false dichotomies. One of the pieces I co-wrote some years ago that's in my book, uh, uh, White Lives Matter Most, is um, that the dichotomies raised between Malcolm and Martin uh, have to be uh, exposed and exploded, that we have to refuse to choose between a Malcolm or a Martin perspective, that in fact, in the 21st century, understanding the power and importance of both of those men is significant. And I think Tutu is right there in the middle. Uh, I, I don't really feel like he was very comfortable with just war. Uh, nor was he comfortable with the with the uh, phrase of of nonviolence. So that's my best uh, analysis of who he was. What you say, Michael, about uh, his critiques of the ANC, um, in terms of a very public piece, are are true and correct. But his uh, quieter critiques of of what the ANC, you know, was or could be, uh, predated that. Uh, on the other hand, that didn't stop him at all from working very closely with ANC members and leadership throughout. Um, is violence or violence of the type in January 6 ever justified? Well, 
I mean, I don't really believe that any political actions are, uh, are, are neutral. So, you know, for the Nationalist Party in South Africa uh, to say that they need justice too is a, is a different ring than the masses of African peoples who were, uh, you know, under the gun, uh, under apartheid. So those who, you know, stormed the capital a year ago uh, in defense of the, and very much propelled on by the sitting president have a different approach towards power and violence, and, you know, power including armed power than those people who have been historically oppressed. So while I don't really sit comfortably with the idea that violence is ever justified, I sit much, much less comfortably with the idea that violence in support of the most powerful, in support of the oppressors, in support of those who in fact have great access they stormed the Capitol because the dude in the White House said it was okay to come. And so to me, that has to be factored into any analysis. Uh, having said that, you know, the question about the justification of violence uh, for what one might call left or progressive or anti-oppression or liberatory armed struggle is one I don't think we can have a simplistic answer to. So while I do believe there's a great deal of evidence to suggest at very least, at very least, that the power of mass, radical, nonviolent action has not been in any way, shape or form fully realized in people's movements around the globe. Uh, at the same time, I don't wanna simply discard and say violence is never under any circumstance justified because I think that's, that's an oversimplification. And so when I talk about simplifications, really simplistic pacifism is not a phrase I'm taking from somewhere, but not what I'm suggesting we create. The, the phrase I, I've written about much more uh, extensively and profoundly has been dogmatic pacifism. A pacifism that says that because of my beliefs about violence and nonviolence, I can't speak to you for demo. Front for the Liberation of Mozambique. I can't speak to you, ANC, African National Congress, because you took up armed struggle. I can't speak to you, uh, you know, Black Liberation Army. I can't even speak to you because you've taken up arms. That to me is a dogma that suggests something that is not really about liberation. And if we're about liberation, we have to be open to conversations with everyone who is working towards an end to oppression, an end to injustice, people's liberation and lasting peace, even if they have taken up tactics that some of us find to be problematic. So a non-dogmatic pacifism, a pacifism that especially if it comes from the US, especially from people who look like me, gendered, racialized, aged the way I am, then it becomes nothing but paternalistic. It comes nothing but, again, a colonial reality saying, I know something you don't know. I have the truth that you don't have. Listen to me or else you're doing it wrong. And that can be never, never, never the basis of liberation, never the basis of unity, never the basis of a, a, a beloved community that is going to end up in nonviolence because the very approach of that dogmatism is violent. Uh, truth, reparations, reconciliation, what is it packaged together? Um, you know, to me, resistance is the summary. It's, it's, it's a balance between reconciliation and resistance which maybe I find easy to think about because of my history with the War Resistance League and the Fellowship of Reconciliation. But to me, there, there are two sides of the very same coin. You can't cash that coin unless you understand that you're working with both sides of them. And I guess in, in answer to your question uh, about that, um, I feel like 
one of the things that a predominantly white group can do and that an interracial group can do is begin to, to tick away at this question of white fragility. That issue nowadays is, is such a key one in talking about white folk. And it's not exactly like we can get away with the whiteness of America. January 6, 2021 shows that. But fragility is the wrong way of framing it. And so a class consciousness, uh, uh, I would say a, a human consciousness, humanitarian consciousness, uh, that ultimately we do have to work together uh, is a vital piece of our work. Even as we can say, white people need to understand black leadership. White people need to understand uh, Latinx self-determination. We can't always be at the center and at the head of and with the financial controls of all the organizations we're part of. So the fragility question has to be dealt with head on in modeling coalition and intersectional work. And so I'll end with this one point, and I know I'm going a little bit long. To me, the most significant lesson from South Africa about systemic racism or systemic anything was the last years of the 80s, which more than any armed action on the part of the ANC or the PAC, more than any threat of violence, more than anything, helped bring about the end to political apartheid as it did, was the idea that the apartheid state would be made ungovernable. And the COVID-19 pandemic has already shown us ways in which the US government on a federal and state and local levels is not doing their jobs. Therefore, Creating alternate structures, be they small interfaith community groups like this one, or larger attempts at educational alternatives that UTLA in your town is trying to do under a more progressive leadership than most of the rest of the teachers unions. Okay, okay, some people have UTLA t-shirts on now. Nice tie in there. But the creating of alternate structures that help model some of the ways in which we're dealing with systemic racism. Is there racism in this group, in ICU PJ, JP? I'm sorry, I may have gotten the acronym a little bit wrong. I'll get better when I'm a full member in an hour. But the fact is, I'm sure there's racism in this group because there's racism in America, so how could there not be? But the question is, how do you deal with it? How does UTLA deal with it? How do we in our alternative structures model and end to our institutional systemic and interpersonal racisms? By doing that and by creating more and more robust and interconnected alternative institutions, we do what that question asked us to do. We do what some of the South Africans did in the late 80s. We create some examples of how systemic issues can be dealt with outside of the structures of the current government, because the current government ultimately must be made ungovernable in order for us to have lasting and long-term and effective peace with justice. Thank you. I'm going to have to kind of draw this to a close, I'm afraid, because we're kind of hitting 9.30. Um, I just wanted to uh, read to everybody what Jasmine put in the chat. Remember, she couldn't do her presentation. Um, it's short. She wrote, there will be no future without forgiveness. Any process of peace is bound to collapse if this is missing. There is no way peace and stability can come through the gun of vengeance. A quote from Desmond Tutu. That was what she was trying to read to us, I think, in the car. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't totally cut you off there, but I'm just kind of watching the clock because I know that we have another meeting coming up and you probably do too. Um, thank you so much. I think we're all very moved and very educated by it and delighted to have you join our group. Um, yeah, thank, any... thank, really, thanks so much, Matt. I, I do want to yeah. remind people we, we have the meeting after. We'll take a little bit of a break uh, when this wraps up, but uh, you can stay on the same call to discuss the... Uh, 
faith-rooted network on ending systemic racism. We're trying to have an event on the 23rd of January. That's a Sunday uh, special meeting, 4 to 6 p.m. that date. Can I ask Maggie and Anthony to stay after for a half a minute after we close so I can speak to you? Thank you. Okay, any other announcements? No. Ruby? I just want to make sure that everybody recognizes that Fidel Sanchez is with me. Oh, oh. Yeah, I, good I morning. Have... Hi, Fidel. Fidel, nice to uh, Happy you. New Year. I'm sorry, I had to take Jasmine to the airport this morning. I couldn't be in the meeting, but I tried to be there at least every end of the year. Uh -huh. <laughs> once a year. Oh, once a year. But good to see you guys. Uh, I'll just make another quick announcement. The, 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 uh, um, uh, Harriet Tubman uh, Center for Social Justice actually got the initial permit for the Martin Luther King March and Rally this year. There's a controversy going on because uh, CORE insists that they want to do the one that they always do with the uh, police and the uh, ROTC units and Homeland Security. So uh, it may be coming to the uh, LA uh, Police Commission on Tuesday morning at 930 for a resolution. Or the, uh, it's not clear how it's going to get settled. Um, but uh, uh, Harriet Tubman had the permit application in in July and CORE didn't ask for theirs until a few weeks ago. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll send some word out if that does come to the, uh, uh, the police commission meets by Zoom Tuesday morning at 9.30. Uh, but one way or the other, I think there will be a, uh, you know, movement uh, march. It might be, uh, have to coordinate times or something uh, on the 17th, uh, starting from Harvard and uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard. And the uh, the festival in Lamert Park is now separated from the uh, the uh, Kingdom Day Parade piece of it that Core always did, so that will also be happening separately. Oh, yeah. I, I just want to say that in commemoration of January's um, the, being this anti Guantanamo, close Guantanamo, uh, recommend another movie, and it's. Uh, not only a uh, movie about torture, but it's a uh, narrative movie, not a documentary, with uh, Natalie Portman and Javier Bardem. Um, it's called Goya's Ghost. So really recommend everybody this week, rent it from the library, or borrow it from the library, or download it, or whatever you do to see movies. Goyas Can you put Ghost. the name in the chat? Sure, we will do. Okay, all right. Thank Rose, you. if you Rose, have you opened our circle to uh, lifting up, folks? Well, I was about to, and Ruby is. Oh, the, uh, yes, and Ruby then. Yes, do, I'm here. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I just want to say, but, Matt, uh, the way you're 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 empowered at, with your wisdom and guidance, and bring it to us. Possibly, you can come back later on. Maybe we could do a seminar or something with you uh, for the positive links and things that we can do in response to working through violence and the will to take make the change, releasing the ego. You are, and Rose, I want to tell you, you're a wonderful facilitator. Thank you so much. But Matt, you're, you're special. Thank you. And so as we open this, I want to thank Jasmine, too, for her work. And each and everyone on here who has worked, Michael and, you know, everyone else. So as we open this, and Anthony, I'm just so glad you're, you're here. But is it possible now for us just to be still for a moment and know we are bringing into what it is that we want to see happen for the positive changes? and the works of not just this United States, but the world. I'll open with, I'm just grateful to have Matt here and to work through what we need to do through powerful change to our children as they're able to understand and listen and pass it on.
for peace, respect, right communication, understanding. And this is a great year. And I pass. If that is the opening of the circle, uh, let me lift up my son-in-law, Alan Weyhausen in, in uh, Santa Rosa, uh, Sebastopol, who tested positive for COVID and is awaiting his PCR test. Uh, so um, that's just very heavy on my heart right now. Um, if you can also keep my uh, my dad's um, COVID um, struggle right now in, in your hearts as well. And um, I, I, um, <clears throat> I understand that this morning, uh, a, a brilliant actor and a great um, uh, man who worked for civil rights and funded the civil rights movement uh, early on. Sidney Poitier passed mm. away today. Um, oh, no. Yeah. Oh. So, um, he did a lot of really good work, and he and mm -hmm. Harry Belafonte were uh, mm -hmm. instrumental in, in putting a lot of cash into the civil rights movement in the 60s. So you can lift him yeah. up as well. Thanks. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, I, I um, uh, last week I asked people to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, Matt Matt uh, uh, Harper in in mind. His father was uh, uh, in hospice care, and uh, he did actually pass uh, last Friday morning. So uh, the Harper family have been uh, part of this circle. His mother more often than his dad, but. Uh, um, uh, just uh, keep uh, keep their uh, mourning and grief uh, in, in your hearts uh, for that loss. Yes, I wanted to uplift uh, my mother-in-law. She also tested positive on this COVID-19. And so we hope for betterment for her and her health. Thank you. 